Hey, John, can you hear me? Good morning, everyone. I can hear you, Reed. Love the right, I'm gonna try. What? I love that you're in the car. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to uh, not sign in with video. Hold on. <laughs> Okay. Well, I can actually enable all participants to share screen. That'll work. All right. Yeah, we're all set. Okay. Welcome to the first class lecture of the fall semester. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Jonathan Evans. He is a professor of English in our English department here at Clarkson University and he received his PhD in rhetoric from Texas Women's University. And much of his research is centered on comic books, graphic novels, and visual rhetoric. Currently, he has a graphic novel on the Orangeburg Massacre, forthcoming from um, University of South Carolina Press, and a book on Superman versus Trump is in development for University of Mississippi Press. And his talk today is titled, Marvel Cinematic Universe, MCU, versus the DC Cinematic Universe, the Snyderverse, Ideological Conceptions of the Superhero. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, so let me go ahead and share my screen here. I'll go ahead and get started. And boom. All right, so uh, I have here, the, you know, as we said, the MCU versus the Snyderverse, ideological conceptions of superhero. So the origins for this presentation actually came uh, during a um, vi video I was watching on YouTube by a, a channel called Screen Crush called Zack Snyder, the real difference between the Snyderverse and the MCU that was uploaded to YouTube in uh, May 28th, 2021. And what the essay, the essay basically boils down is the central idea of what's going on and working inside Zack Snyder's conception of the DC movie adaptations, and then compares it to the MCU with the Marvel Cinematic Universe uh, movie franchises. Uh, but before I get into that, I want to do a little context because I do want to give uh, Ryan Airy a lot of credit here. He is the author of the Screen Crush essay that I am referencing here. Um, and it's an attempt to examine Zack Snyder to better understand his vision of superheroes. Uh, and when presented with two seemingly connected ideas, it's natural desire to compare him. And that's paraphrasing Ryan Airy there. And he notes that both cinematic universes have superheroes in individual films, which lead up into team films uh, with the DC universe. It was Man of Steel, where they reintroduced Superman leading up to the Justice League movie. Marvel took a much longer route, starting with the Iron Man film and then eventually culminating in the Avengers. And of course, Ryan Airy says, to really understand any work of art, you have to examine the artist who created it. Uh, once you understand the lens the artist sees their world through, you can understand their art. And I found this very helpful for me because I have always struggled to see where Zack Snyder was coming from in his conception of superheroes. So just a little bit of a surface comparison here between Snyderverse or Snyder's conception of the DC universe versus the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Of course, Z Zack Snyder has a tendency to use very muted or washed out colors, very visually cinematic, very mythological, highly individualistic characters, near godlike characters and their abilities versus Marvel, which tends to be far more colorful, uh, visually stunning, but also down to earth individual characters um, that find it much easier or struggle to find better ways to cooperate with each other. And there was a varied range of characters from everyday characters, like perhaps Ant-Man all the way up to godlike ones like Thor. Um, some more contrasts, um, adding to our list of contrasts, of course, the Snyderverse makes much more use of the mythic or vivid imagery uh, than Marvel does. Despite the imagery and the tone of Snyder's movies, uh, appear to make the case that superheroes hate being superheroes. It sort of seems to be a trend that I noticed and others have noticed. Uh, there's a joylessness a lot of times in some of the way that superheroes are depicted versus, shall we say, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And of course, that's in stark contract, the MCUs that typically depict elements of colorfulness and joy, humor sprinkled in here and there. So the central tenets of contrasting Snyder's vision of superheroes is rooted in a philosophical distinctions between, and this was something that Ryan Airy brought my attention to in his video, the notions of individualism versus collectivism as philosophical points of understanding human, in, human individuality and human interaction. So individualism 
Um, modern individualism is typically defined in relation to Ayn Rand's objectivist philosophy, not personally a fan, but Rand held that individualism regards man as an independent sovereign entity and that the group has no rights other than the individual rights of its members. To put this another way, the individual always unfettered self-interest of a rational human nature. So that's... In contrast, is a general belief that more can be achieved through cooperations and team efforts. Um, there is an element of altruism to it, but again, this is not a black and white distinction, but that's part of Rand's objection is this altruism. Of course, what Rand's individualism is often pitted against, <coughs> excuse me, is there is a strong need in Rand's philosophy for collectivism to be ultra altruistic and sort of act like a boogeyman. Uh, opposition requires this extreme conception of collectivism to really work. And of course, I would posit that Rand would actually reject the idea, as we will see in the MCU, that heroes may be powerful individuals, but together they can do even more. And so individualism working in this contrasting collectivism where individualism would stress the individual, of course, versus collectivism offering the idea that more can be achieved together. Now, I want to take a slight moment here to note a little bit about bringing in Grant Morrison, who is a comics writer himself. And in his book, Super Gods, he noted two approaches that creators bring to whatever subject matter they're working with. He calls these two approaches missionaries and anthropologists. For Morrison notes that some writers come to as missionaries who attempt to impose their own values and preconceptions of culture, like about comic books, that they consider to be inferior. So you think about a missionary going into a foreign country and imposing a point of view, what we might today call colonizers, whereas to see this another way, there are those creators who come to comic book superheroes and properties looking to do what they want uh, without feeling any deep-seated connection to them or sometimes even respect for what they mean to other people. Zack Snyder in his individualism basically comes off a lot of ways to what, what Morrison would call a missionary. And we'll return to this anthropologist notion here in a minute. So Snyder is a missionary, okay? So there are many ways that creators who are missionaries uh, in their approach. So uh, a strong tell for us is often that we can see a creator's own pre preconceptions or tendencies projected onto the subject matter. Uh, one of, of course, one of the most important characters, probably the most of all in Snyder's DC superhero movies is Superman. And this is where a very clear distinction is borne out. Snyder projects his worldview, his own experiences and beliefs to the audience through his interpretation of Superman. And this is where part of the problem happens. So on the surface, Superman appears to be an individualistic hero, sort of custom made. For Rand, the true heroic man is the one who serves his self-interest first, individual over the collective with the ideal that a man should never sacrifice their own interests or desires for a perceived common good. This feels like it doesn't really match up how many see Superman, including myself, not when you really look beneath the surface. So it is undeniable that Zack Snyder has an incredibly unique and vivid vision as a director. Despite that, Zack Snyder's conception of Superman, of that essence as influenced by Rand, is wrong. Uh, and of course, this is present and probably why I had such a strangely adverse reaction when Man of Steel was released in 2013. And it's kind of just beneath the surface. So individualism here is part of the problem in this conception of Superman. It would work great if he was simply making a film about Batman. Um, it's an ideology, of course, individualism is, is an ideological perspective, not a personal descriptor. Superman's essence centers around ideas that are more attuned with collectivism. Um, is he exceptional? Yes. But what makes Superman, as many know him, is what he does with that exceptionalism, 
with those powers that forms his essence. So a hero is someone who has given his or her life to something bigger than oneself. So Snyder's conception of the Clark Kent Superman is molded to be more in the embodiment of a Rand's individualistic hero. For Rand, the concept of man as a heroic being with own, his own happiness as moral purpose of his life with productive achievement as his noblest activity and reason as his only absolute. Rand's vision of a hero operates as the guiding principle at the heart of how Snyder depicts Superman and other superheroes in his movies, such as Batman v Superman and his version of the Justice League. So the Snyderverse problem. William Brantley in a 2016 review of Man of Steel specifically points out that we never get the sense that he's Superman's doing things, saving others because he feels like he ought to be doing them. At no point do we get the sense that he is really sacrificing anything for the benefit of others, quite the contrary, in fact. Snyder's Clark Kent Superman was raised and nurtured by Jonathan and Martha Kent that encouraged him to hide who he was and what he could do, and by consequence, avoid helping others for fear of discovery. Like Rand's arguments against altruism, doing good for others will only get you punished. Now, the straw man fallacy in Snyder and, and Snyder Superman. So Rand's take on collectivism, altruism is a bit of a straw man fallacy because she is relying on this extreme interpretation. Because the reality is, is that Superman is by nature altruistic. Snyder's Superman, though, does do good for others, but there's a catch. On closer examination of his motives, he maintains a clear self-interest and in some cases, even callousness towards others. Some examples. Take, for example, Man of Steel. He saves oil workers, but in no way ends up exposing his identity or being you know, found out. He kills God, I'm sorry, he kills Zod to save Earth because he lives there. And Zod threatened his own mother's life, his own human mother's life, Martha. He saves Lois Lane because he's in love with her, even makes out with her in the midst of parts of destroyed Metropolis, which I saw this in the video that Ryan Airy showed. And I think he counts eight full seconds. They're literally standing there making out in the ruins of Metropolis. And when I looked back on that, I was like, wow, that was way more inappropriate than I thought. Um, and Batman v Superman, when um, Lex Luthor ends up setting a bomb and blowing up the Senate building where they're holding hearings and the Capitol explosion happens and he happens to be the sole survivor, rather than do anything, he flies away. That's where the callousness comes in. Even when he charges and kills Doomsday at the end of the film, he does so not knowing that the kryptonite would end up stabbing or killing him. He was not really engaged in any self-sacrifice. It was more like he was accidentally killed. So this can be contrast with Superman's death, particularly in 1992 in the comic books, which were coming up on, the, I guess we're on the 30th anniversary now, where he fought the Doomsday then. And when he does that one in the comic books, he has the self-awareness of knowing he will die versus in the Batman v Superman movie where it's more like he didn't realize he was going to die. So there is a difference there in that in the comic book interpretation, he was making a real sacrifice. Um, and now carrying this over here, Snyder's heroes start from the perspective perspective as Superman does in Man of Steel, that humanity needs to earn the superhero's trust rather than the other way around. Snyder's superheroes are like gods from Mount Olympus who know what's best and they deign to descend to, descend to help us. Um, the Snyder cut of Justice League shows no dissent and clear self-interest belief in their decision to resurrect Superman. They don't even really question it. Batman, Wonder Woman's, Aquaman, Cyborg, and Flash are all coming together and acting out of self-interest of their own, which happen to align with saving the world they live in, rather than any kind of actual discussion. Now, this can be contrasted to the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So Superman's death, <coughs> excuse me, and Batman and Superman is not an act of self-sacrifice. It's, it's a self-interest that happens to go bad. Self-sacrifice is what Tony Stark, a.k.a. Iron Man, did at the end of Avengers Endgame. By the way, 
quick heads up. I'm terribly sorry if I'm spoiling any of this for anybody. Um, in fact, one could argue more somewhere else, of course, that Stark is himself starts out as a prototypical Ayn Rand hero, individualistic, who then kind of evolves into a more altruistic, collective seeking superhero. You could actually make the argument that's his entire arc in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Now, the MCU, unlike the Snyder controlled DC universe, began as the coming together of a team of uh, a team of creators to form uh, a, and basically come to get committed that originally they formed a committee where the films before they were handed over to Kevin Feige, they started out as a group uh, making decisions. Of course, this is unlike Zack Snyder. Kevin Feige was actually a fan of comic books. He fits more into anthropological notion, as I point out here, not a missionary, but an anthropological who wants to appreciate the source material he's working with. The MCU represents more of a collective effort like the heroes in it who formed the Avengers coming together to work together to achieve more than what one could do alone. And a lot of this individualism versus collectivism, collectivism elements, the ideas of the Snyderverse versus the MCU can be really expressed and seen through the expression of their different teams. So in Marvel's Avengers 2012, one witnesses the growing pains of an individuals who are not all in agreement being pulled, pushed, and forced to work together. It is, of course, Nick Fury, played by Samuel L. Jackson, who sums up perhaps what might be the best way to sum up what is going on. He states, and it is repeated in the trailer of later Avengers film, but like a shadow over all of it. There was an idea. The idea was to bring together a group of remarkable people to see if they could become something more, to see if they could work together when we needed them to, to fight the battles we could never. This speaks to the kind of collective desire that more can always be achieved by cooperation to become more and overcome more than what any individual can do alone. So take the Avengers, a team made up of strong individuals with strong personalities who are able and willing to overcome their personal self-interest and differences to achieve a greater good against incredibly powerful foes. They actively choose, in some cases, even surrender their free will or subvert it to do what is needed to serve a greater good. This can be contrasted, of course, with the Justice League, the group, I wouldn't call it a team, I think it's appropriate that we call it a league of individuals making decisions. In Snyder's particular cut, of, there is a distinct difference as compared to the Joss Whedon original cut from 2017, who make decisions without hesitation in what they are doing. When fighting the enemy, they are chaotic, sporadic, and often particularly tripping over each other. They're not a team. Uh, much time is spent jockeying as individual heroes are almost unable to work together. It's like a miracle it all comes together. Now, the end game. Every character in the MCU actively seeks as real heroes do, to prove that he or she is worthy. They have doubts and wrestle with them. They are mostly human. They see their role of being a superhero as a privilege, a call to serve. You know, if we use the Spider-Man line, with great power comes great responsibility. All right? And they see this as a privilege and not a right. Iron Man is a prime example of that growth within a heroic framework. In Avengers 2012, Captain America accuses Tony Stark of not being the guy to throw himself in harm's way to save others. In 2012, Captain, um, you will see there that in the end, Iron Man, by the time we get to 2018, 2019, Tony Stark is the one who chooses to use the Infinity Stones to stop Thanos. So he starts from a very highly selfish position and ends up in a very true, being a true heroic hero. Stark's death in Endgame actively opposes Rand's conceptions of a hero as well as that of individualism. It's a conscious self-sacrifice for others. Tony saw what using the Infinity Stones did to the Hulk earlier on in the film, nearly kills him, and knows that using them might very well do to him. It might actually kill him. Tony Stark's journey is from a life of selfishness and self-interest to embracing the mantle of a hero and despite his active and natural resistance to the role. He evolves from becoming a hero and learns sacrifice for the greater good and a collectivist ideal, unlike Snyder's Superman. 
So it's clear success that the MCU over Snyder's conceived depiction of the DC superheroes is one that clearly demonstrated in our culture through our wallets, okay? Though it is not 100% clear, there is somewhere, there's somewhere in that success that the Marvel movies have a reality of that true essence of superheroes that stems not from an individual's conception and self-interest, but from a collective desire to do good and help others. Humanity, for all its protestations of individualism, is and always has been a collective endeavor for mutual survival. Real superheroes re exist to remind us of that. Thank you. Thank you. And I've included here at the end uh, a link to uh, the actual YouTube video that he puts on. Yeah, we have plenty of time for questions. So, doors open. I know I'm definitive in my statements and my arguments, so it's fine. <laughs> hey, Jonathan. Yes, Reed. Have you um have you read a Zizek's critique of Batman? It's on my list. I have not gotten to that one yet. No, I'm aware of it though. Okay, I would I would highly recommend it because he talks about um, how Batman's kind of like a right wing vigilante, uh, vigilante and uh, he gives a, a real interesting uh, kind of uh, criticism of it that I think would fold pretty nicely into what you're doing. Okay, excellent. I'll have, I'll have to I move also, that up. I also think um, the fact that uh, Superman's a journalist kind of accords with what you're saying more than Snyder, but um, I don't really know enough about it. But uh, yeah, I thought it was interesting. Thank you. Any other questions? Statements, comments? Don't be like my class, guys. Come on. <laughs> I'm just going to poke you there. Well, um... I've I've always viewed Batman as a as a superhero who does what um, what he has to do partially to overcome his childhood trauma, but also he doesn't really do it for for the glory. He works with law enforcement because it's the right thing to do, and he tries to keep his identity hidden as far as he can. I mean, in many versions and early movies, we I mean, many people do not know who uh, Bruce Wayne actually is, and I think Superman is always in the spotlight. I mean, yes, he is he is Clark Kent, but. Once he comes Superman, he's in, almost invincible except for Kryptonite. So I think I think Batman is a is a much let's say weaker person, a more vulnerable person, because he's still human and he relies on technology um, to do what he does. And Superman can fly, he can um, you know, shoot lasers from his eyes, whatever he can. That's it always bothered me a bit that um, Superman is this invincible figure who <clears throat> really doesn't need anyone to, to, do, to do what he does. What do you think? See, my issue there is this. This is the conceptual issue I think we have when we understand superheroes. It's not what they can do, it's what they do with what they have. And one of the things that I didn't include there, but Glenn Weldon has two central tenets that he says defines the essence of Superman. And it's that he never gives up and he sacrifices for other people. And that is quintessentially, the sacrificing for other people is the element that Zack Snyder completely misses. The point on he sees superman um in a very over the top kind of individualistic selfish hero that runs really grains runs against the grain of what the character is really supposed to be and i've always thought of the idea of what made me realize the importance of superman was when i understood it's not what he can do it's what he chooses to do with that he understands that the real superman the comic books tend to understand that notion that Peter Parker and the Spider-Man with the great power comes great responsibility. Snyder's conception like throws it out the window, but I think that's a really quintessential way of defining what superheroes are meant to represent. And in particular, what appeals me, not so much to Superman, but what appeals me in the Marvel Cinematic Universe is that they are more able and more willing to embrace that idea of superheroes as having being more identifiable to us and connecting with us and showing us what humans can tend to do naturally or do best or achieve more when we do when we do is when we work collectively together 
we achieve far more than we do individualistically. And I think them being able to show that expression helps reinforce that notion inside of our culture. Thank you. So Dr. Edwards, do you think that um, because of your focusing on a single director who's done a series of DC movies um, is limited compared to the MCU universe, which uses a series of directors and has a whole, you know, boatload of characters that play into their uh, superhero motifs? Well, that's the other element that's underlying a lot of this issue is that Outside of more recent films with Wonder Woman and Aquaman and a few other examples, Suicide Squad, the core DC movies, Man of Steel, Batman v Superman, Justice League, were defined by one director. Mm -hmm. And that's part of the equation that I found myself um, butting up against was the idea that from the get go, it was like one, one director's conception was driving a central the central line inside the entire DC universe versus the Marvel conception that feel, felt more organic. That was another thing is that's a completely side issue, but Marvel went through an entire process of doing a series of individual movies, introducing their characters before you got to a team movie. Mm -hmm. DC tried to make the leap in three. Like it was playing catch up, you know, to the, like they were, of course, Marvel and DC are always in competition with each other, but I felt like their abandonment of this organic development was another hindrance that I think undermined them, not to mention that I also don't feel or don't find Snyder's particular interpretation to be one that's truly identifiable or matches well with some of the characters. Like I said, if he was doing this and it was a Batman film, I don't think I'd have as much objection to it because I think Batman fits more within that conception of the individualistic, but when it's when he applied to Superman that I found myself, I, I can remember in 2013 when I saw the film and I left it going, I don't know what to think of that. Like I was literally quite puzzled. Like I didn't know what to think. And it was only recently and like, as of like eight years later, when I saw that video by Ryan Arias, like, that's it. That was my problem the whole time, right beneath the surface. So then did you follow up? Did you think that your bias from watching Superman on television played a, and maybe reading the comments played heavily into how your interpretation of the Zack Snyder film was? I, I think it definitely did because most interpretations of Superman in TV and films and comic books have a consistency to them and it feel like they better understood the character versus Snyder who tried to do something radically different and because it was so radically different I think that there is a bias I know there's a bias but I also don't think it works I think it tries to radically depart from the essence of a character and if you create a, if you take a character and you diverge it from its essence you're going to find maybe it works but I don't think in this case it really did so thank you very much you're welcome Jonathan? Dr. Burns, how are is, you? Yeah, Hugh Burns, great to see you again. I always like to see what you're up to in your own little universe. <laughs> you know, I've, I've kind of always liked Fury. He seems like the organizer of the uh, and the collaborator. And what's the origin of his, uh, his story? Uh, well, the Nick Fury in the comic books was actually his own individual character. They adapted this differently for the for the Marvel Cinematic Universe, but in the comic books, he was a super spy. Um, it was only when they did a, what was called the Ultimates Universe, where they actually adapted an African American. Uh, the Brian Hitch, the artist, actually took his inspiration when he changed Nick Fury up. He actually took Samuel L. Jackson as his uh -huh. inspiration. And then when the time came to make the movies and they wanted to introduce him, they reached out and said, hey, you want to play this character? And he was like, yes. <laughs> so it's, it's one of those circumstances where someone molded the depiction of the character and modeled it after a real life actor who just happenstance sort of came back around and then actually ended up being the character. And they did change him, borrowing from that ultimate universe where he did form the team 
but that was not something that was in the traditional comic books originally. Okay. That's very cool stuff. Onward in the cause, man. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Evans, just a quick yes. question. Um, you know, we all know that these superhero movies have made a ton of money for Hollywood. Um, uh, and this might be impossible to answer, but do you foresee uh, these, these movies continue to being, do you think that they'll, they'll continue to keep being made and, and rebooted and reinvented? Or, or is this just a passing temporary fad? How do you, how do you see the, the future of, of of superhero films maybe hard to answer no that's a, i think it's a good question i would hope it's not a passing fad honestly um if i think back to the early days when they tried to get some of this started with the x-men back in like 2000 it was very popular and then it kind of seemed to subside but i think there is something about it that and i think what i like most about the way that the marvel universe is being run is that not only did they come out the gate strong using their core characters, but as they, and this is why I hope it continues, is that one of the outgrowths that I have most appreciated, even though there are fandom fanboys who would disagree, and most of them are just chauvinistic, um, I'll keep it polite there, dorks, morons, and idiots, but they have objected to the fact that since Marvel made such a huge successful splash with their main movies, they have been slowly growing out and reaching into corners of the comic book universe and leading to greater representation. Um, the su success of Disney Plus shows like Miss Marvel, where we have a Pakistani, young female Pakistani girl who's Muslim, She-Hulk, we're having more female characters yeah. They're taking central roles and we're getting stronger representation among different diverse groups that have been and found voices in comic books. But the fact that the Marvel has cached their early success to now make these expansions is, I think, exactly what they should be doing. And if for some reason that fails, it'll be tragic, but at least they try. Yeah. And I think that's great. I mean, I think that exposure is needed. I think pushing that exposure out into our larger visual culture and cinema pays dividends. I mean, look at Black Panther. Yeah, That movie was hugely successful. And I think the continuation of things like that, I mean, the new Black Panther is going to pay a tribute to Chadwick Boseman. They're not recasting his character. And I think that's great. That trailer made me cry. But I also saw in the trailer, they're going to be introducing Ironheart who's a young African-American girl who was inspired by Iron Man and made her own suit of armor. And I'm like, yes, let's do this. I mean, it makes me excited. Some people out there, some dumb fanboys are like, oh, why is it all, what happened to the male characters? I'll go cry in a river somewhere. This is stuff in the comic books. It's great. Yeah. More voices, the better. And that's what I hope. I like, that's why I like most about what Marvel's doing is that they took that early success <coughs> And they're growing things out. They're trying different things, and they're bringing in more voices, which I love, and I think it's fantastic. And I hope it's Dr. Evans. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Evans. Could I push back on you just a little bit? Go ahead. I I completely agree with your point about representation, and I think that's absolutely, you know, true and beneficial. But the way these movies come out, they happen within a very narrow political framework. So like even the Black Panther has a very neoliberal kind of agenda to it. And so I think what you say about representation is correct, but I don't think that the politics or the ethos of these films are 100% positive. Does that make sense? I understand. I would push back on the Black Panther because I think Black Panther did a very good job of sort of pushing back against uh, a very anti-colonialist notion to it. But I, I do understand that there's, of course, a, a wider politics in here and that, of course, there is going to be politics behind the scene and it is a capitalistic venture. I, I understand that. Um, I guess my, for me, it's like you gotta, you, you're not going to reinvent the system. You've got to work with what you have. And I think where they can push, it's good. Um, and I think that that should continue and maybe it'll bring about some small changes along the way. Yeah, 
Yeah, that I understand. And I think, um, you know, that's a, it's an interesting conversation. Absolutely. Oh, I, I think that's a great conversation because there is deep complexity in all these things. I mean, the individualism collectivism angle that I talked about in my presentation wasn't even a conception that I even had necessarily explored until I stumbled across that video. And then it completely opened up and I've actually been, this presentation um, and the research I've done, I've actually been uh, approached to do a book proposal about this. So maybe in that I'll get to dig a little bit deeper. So I was actually approached about a book proposal for this one. That's my next project is based on this presentation. So there might be room for me to explore other more complex issues in the process. Well, I mean, I think the other thing we have to think about is that comic books were kind of designed to, to have make people happy in many respects. So if you start to really, not saying they don't have a political component in them, but I mean, like, so ask the question, if Superman came to Earth today and he didn't have a green card, would he be allowed to stay in the United States? You know, I mean, so, you know, you start putting it in the context of the present day and the politics of the present day, it, it may take away some of the aspects of, of some of the fun of comics. Well, and that's the thing about comic books. Comic books actually have a very vast and complex history that has always fascinated me. And I've studied some of it, but just like from their early origins into the modern day, there isn't a subject matter or a topic that you can't cover mm -hmm. in a visual narrative comic book. I mm -hmm. mean, my shelves are littered with representations of different topics, different angles, different politics, different philosophies, different stories, different interpretations of literature. And you're right. And I actually saw this terrible uh, parody cartoon that was meant to mock um, the current, or well, shall we say, not current, but current um, illegal alien type uh, anti-immigrant sentiment by showing the idea of Superman's pod crash landing today and whoever finds him going, you're not supposed to be here. Where are you from? Where are your, where's your green card? Where's your papers? You know, wanting to ship him out of the country because he literally is an illegal alien, an actual alien who is not here legally. But back in the 1960s, DC Comics did give him a social security number. So... Uh, Dr. Evans. Yes. Um, so I should preface this by saying Any that I do a horrible questions? job with keeping up with uh, movies and things. I want to, but it's just a lot. And with little kids, I just never seem to be able to find the time. Um, when they get older, you will. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm, I'm just curious about, um, I, I'm speaking out of ignorance here, but I, I wonder if you could say a word about is, is Snyder vocal about these influences from Rand? Um, is this a heuristic tool that you're using that you're, you know, are you bringing this? Is, is he vocal about this? And also, I'm just curious about whether or not you think um, this individualism and these influences have affected in a negative way uh, the other movies that he's done as well. Well, see, I've, I've seen some of his other movies. It's really only been in his superhero movies that this has been quite pronounced. And I will say that Ryan Airy did much better job of investigating some of that. So I'm building on what he was investigating because he goes into an entire thing about talking about Snyder's interviews with where he was influenced by his story about the, about the seagull. And that has all these interconnected things that tie into. So there have been people who have recognized and about, he's actually been, he's been trying to get a, adaptation of the fountainhead by ayn rand made so it's it's out there i didn't necessarily touch on it but the video that ryan airy does does talking about where you can see that this is a direct heuristic element that he has been that has played a heavy influence on his understanding of the world and therefore from ryan airy's point of view and what i uh, also built upon was this idea that it is very visible particularly in his interpretation of Superman. Like Ryan Airy spends quite a bit of time talking about Man of Steel, where that is probably its most pronounced and sort of sets a tone for the ones that come after. And it's really those three main movies. It's the 
Man of Steel, Batman v Superman, and Justice League that are kind of like the core elements of the DC universe. Though, that being said, that all may be, may be a mute point at this point because now that Discovery has bought Warner Brothers, they appear to be in the process of throwing all of that away, like erasing it. Like, I don't know if they're ever going to release the Flash movie. They've delayed the Shazam movie, the Aquaman movie. Like, they're, I, I feel like they're going to cancel them and just try to start over because he's kind of left them with a train wreck because Snyder did all this and then he kind of got fired. And so now it's like DC was trying to course correct and it's like, I don't know, it's a mess. And it's like, I think it's a mess because they trust, a lot of it I think is a mess because they trusted Zack Snyder it didn't work. They got into a fight with him. And now it's just kind of, you know, a bunch of gobbledygook that seems to be not interconnected. Whereas Marvel flying high under good guidance, you know, and they have a central figure now in Kevin Feige. It started as a committee and then Kevin Feige sort of took the reins and being more of that anthropological point of view where he comes to this as a fan, understanding the material I think he has more respect for it and he has respect for the creators. He picks picks like Taika Watahiti, who is New Zealand. And there's actually a friend of mine, Neil Curtis, who's a comic scholar who pointed out that if you look closely inside of Thor Ragnarok, there is a lot of representation about um, native New Zealanders getting representation in some of the markings and designs, which I thought was fabulous stuff. I didn't even know, but it was snuck in there. So there's a lot of fascinating stuff, but yeah, it is kind of a point of view of Snyder's. And like I said, I don't think it worked because I don't think it's been responded to in the way that the Marvel perspective has. And people vote with their wallets, you know? Anybody else? All right, now, part one of my lecture about the history of comic books coming up next. No. <laughs> that can be my next presentation. Or you can just come to my special topics class. I don't know if anybody else has got any more questions, but feel free to shoot. If not. Jonathan, I, I had, uh, I don't know if it's so much a question, just building off of what, sorry, I've been in and out of the office. So you may have touched on this. We're having tech problems, as you'll see in your email, per <laughs> usual. So, um, but I was actually talking about this yesterday because I'm talking about the rhetorical appeals with my class. And of course, if Doug Root's on, he can echo me here. Uh, I, I like to nerd out with professional wrestling. Um, so do you find that there's a sort of resistance to someone like Superman from some avenues of comic book fans like there would be back in, say, like a 2011 with a John Cena who actually is a uh, sort of superhero now, if you will? With, with Oh, yeah, he's, been, he's, 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 he's transitioned into the whole DC universe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it's, it's good. And that, that's a whole... That's a whole other topic, but I find that there is a resistance. So when we get somebody like CM Punk, we often equate it to somebody who wears a black hat, maybe like a Batman, right? Who has these sort of traumas, the tattoos um, and challenges that good guy, as you said a, a few minutes ago, that never give up of, which was actually John Cena's slogan in WWE. He had the red and white and blue shirt that said, never give up. And, and the fans, good guy or not, resi resisted that. And they challenged that because it was sort of, um, I don't know, um, cliche. And they wanted to go against the grain and wanted to welcome a sort of black hat sort of um, anti-hero, if you will, in CM Punk. So, um, you know, even if you don't know about all that, I was just wondering about the resistance that we sort of see with no. these base characters. No, I, I understand. I mean, Superman is an incredibly difficult character to write, particularly in a continuous comic book narrative. He's one of those characters that I've always thought fits very well into what you might call uh, an epic story, a grand sort of epic narrative. 
where there's like a clear arc for the beginning, middle, and end. He tends to fit better in there, but I think there's a natural inclination in our culture to move between um, a Batman and a Superman. Yeah. Or if you wanted to go Iron Man, Captain America, to right. use the Marvel component, there is this notion that we want the face character, but we're happy if the face character goes away for a time. Um, because sometimes the black hat character, to use your line there about, you know, say a Batman has a lot of appeal um, because he can be, you know, very aspirational. We're, we can sort of somewhat not necessarily relate to his trauma, but we can relate to sort of more or less his wish fulfillment elements of being rich, right. doing good, you know, having a costume, cool gadgets and toys. Whereas Superman also has a wish fulfillment kind of characteristic to him, but like, shall we say a Captain America who has superpowers, there's something about him that sets him apart from us. And I think there's a natural kind of push and give that we sometimes experience. And I think you're right to push that put back, uh, point out there there's a natural push and give and pull shall we say between those characters coming in and leaving out and finding their place and then sometimes we sort of get dismissive and feel oh, we don't need them anymore right you know you can go away now or oh you know i'm a, you know a little too hopeful but the idea for me is that even if we reach that phase i mean there was a phase in my life where i thought superman was lame yeah. <laughs> but he's too powerful and then I realized what I've been missing the whole time wasn't what Superman could do. It's what he represented, something deeper down inside of him. And it wasn't until I actually read All-Star Superman. And there's this wonderful scene, this page where there's this young girl in distress. She's dropped a cell phone. And you think, oh, Superman's going to swoop in and save her. No. He lands behind her, puts his hand on her shoulder, and reminds her that she's stronger than she thinks she is. And I'm like, that's it right there. Yeah. And there are people who've written stories about how reading that page kept them from killing themselves because that girl was obviously about to jump. Right. And I thought it was so powerful because I actually did another presentation where I compared that to an earlier action comic scene back in the 1930s where an, a, a guy in, dressed like he's in an asylum with like a white little bed sheet for an outfit jumps out a window and Superman swoops in and saves him at the last minute. And I talked about how not only is it a different version of Superman's powers on display there and whether or not we want him, he's always there for us. You know, we may like Batman better, but he doesn't go away. But more importantly, I, I also like the fact that it traded mental health differently and it showed an evolution in how we have conceptualized how we treat mental health. But also I think the important, important thing about superman is whether you like him or not or whether he comes and goes he's always there you know you know not to make like you know a too much of a spiritual reference but it's like you you can ignore god but god's always there for you you know superman kind of as serves a similar purpose in that he's still there you can ignore him but if you need someone to come along and inspire you at the right moment and i think that's the same thing for a lot of superheroes they take on those mythical elements and that sometimes represents some idea or some construct. And sometimes we forget about them, but they still remain. Because those ideas have been with us. They are just, as you know, Morrison would argue, Grant Morrison would argue, they're just reincarnations of other spiritual and epic heroes from our past reborn in a new form. Awesome stuff, man. I mean, you could say that pro wrestling is the Greek drama told yeah. in a different fashion. Yeah, like Barth says, it's all mythological criticism to some degree, and those really, you know, echo each other. Um, yeah. and, and comic book fans and wrestling fans, man, I mean, you go to Comic Cons, who do they have there along with, along with all your comic book fans? You got you got the wrestlers doing signings yeah. too, so they really echo each other. It's good stuff. Okay, so any other questions or should we wrap up here? I just want to say that this was a super, super start to this year's lectures. Oh, yeah, well done. Thank you. Well done.
Well yeah. done. And very, yeah. very well, you know, I mean, right. Yeah. Well, I was going to share, you know, a, a silly anecdote. Uh, I attended 12 years of Catholic school and uh, they wanted us not to read comic books. <laughs> it was part of it, right? We, you had to get your library book for the week and you had your book reports, everything, right? Elementary and middle school. But they didn't want us to read comic books. So I had my comic books, you know, in my book bag and I, I read them on the school bus. And, you know, we had this active trade in all these comic books. Oh, yeah. Right? And we had the, we, we traded on the school bus because if you, they, they really discouraged the reading of comic books. They well, said, the pedagogy all that they believed now. it would mess up your writing and your syntax. And that was the view. So that's an old belief that has been thoroughly that's proven, belief, yeah. but that's an old ideology mm -hmm. that comic books would mess you up, but they are now recognized by most librarians and others that they are actually a great gateway. Yeah, well, we call them graphic novels. I mean, you know, we, we, you know, comic books move up. Into, into children's reading material, right? But this was like, it was just not, not allowed. So, so we, I, we smuggled the comic books in and we treated them on the school bus. <laughs> that's yeah, that, that's, said we should, you shared them on the school bus. And you know, I, I, and that I, had, I had two brothers. Industry. I have two brothers who were into all of this, right? So that, that's where I got them from. See, that was a thriving thing back in the day. A lot of times, most of the reason why most old comic books don't survive is two reasons. A lot of them, they were printed on pulp paper, which was usually throwaway. But mm -hmm. two, they were heavily shared right, right, among right. people. Yeah. That used to be a very common thing. That's incredible. That used to be an incredibly common thing. Someone would buy it, and then they would get passed around all their friends. And everybody would read it, and then that's usually why the other reason it would fall apart. Well, That's why most people don't understand that Action Comics, number one, is so valuable today because it survived. <laughs> also, uh, you know, and the analogy I was thinking about this, this comic books would mess up your writing, right? And would and discourage you from reading real books. Okay. And uh, we, when we look at now communication and the language of texting, and, you know, K through 12 <laughs> teachers wage war on texting. Well, well, texting move up as a means of communication is your rhetorician. So I was going to put that up to you. Probably will. I mean, it's already making, I am language and that growth of that. The next one coming behind is going to be language through emojis, which is just going to be reversed into basically hieroglyphics at this rate. Well, we're, we're always responding in emojis. I mean, I get so many texts, mostly I respond in emojis. What am I going to do? Yeah, no time. Well, I mean, like people, people are now literally writing. I've seen this. People wrote out an entire interpretation of movies through emojis. And the idea was you read the lines of emojis and can you guess the movie? But like it, the one you know, I guess was Les Mis. Again, I don't read and write Chinese, right? But if you if you look at so many letters in the Chinese alphabet, that's what they are. That that is that's what they are. I mean, so it is. It goes back to the ancient world. I mean, you know those. Well, even our even our letters that we letters. use today, descending from the Phoenician al Phoenician <laughs> alphabet, started out as image characters image character. that we added linguistic sounds to. And they transform to something else. Scott McCloud talks a lot about this in his book, Understanding Comics, which I love using that as a, as a resource for my students. Well, you know, we have Dr. Hardaway on, you know, some of these letters in, uh, in Old English and Middle English, right? They had some symbolic meanings like the thorn yeah. and, 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 and those kinds of things. But as I said, it, it really goes back to uh, what, we, what we discourage as educators saying that it, 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 will not, it, 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 it will not contribute to good reading writing habits. I mean, that, that actually could move up into very scholarly work. So we're looking forward to your book being in print soon. Yes. It's going to be in print soon, right? Yeah. Yes. All right. Thank you again, Dr. Evans. Thanks to everyone who was in attendance. Uh, very informative and very um, yeah, well done presentation. And we all, I think we all walk away with a lot more to think about regarding comic books and superheroes. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. All right. Thanks. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording and say bye-bye to everyone. <laughs>